down through verse 48. Mark 9, verse 43 through verse 48. Notice an expression that occurs there in verse 44, and verse 46, and verse 48 occurs three times. Now notice something else in that passage. Notice the, notice the occurrence of an expression you hear people talk about uh, called hellfire. People say, I just don't like that hellfire and damnation preaching. Hellfire is a term originated by the Lord Jesus Christ. It's in the passage. Read it right there, verse 40, 43, 44, and 45. There's the expression, hellfire. Uh, Americans, they talk rather loosely. don't know what they're talking about a lot of times. They say, well, I just don't like that hellfire and damnation preaching. Then you wouldn't care for Jesus Christ at all. The expression is his. As a matter of fact, that's the second time he says it. In Matthew chapter 5, he use that term again. That's his term. I didn't invent that term. You get preaching about hell, folks always get kind of nervous and upset, begin to fan themselves. And it's kind of like they thought that hell was some subject that a preacher thought up to scare folks with, or some uh, medieval doctrine, you know, from medieval torture or something like that. But the reason the expression of the Lord Jesus Christ and that pastor before he warns you about it, and warns you about it three times. It's strange the emphasis that people put on positive things when they should believe in the power of negative thinking. I mean, the Lord Jesus Christ, the New Testament, preaches on hell eight times in three years. Eight times. His favorite verse in the Old Testament is from Isaiah chapter 66. And his favorite verse in Isaiah chapter 66, he quotes that verse more than any other verse in the entire Old Testament. And that's where the worm dieth not, the fire is not quenched. He quotes that thing over and over again. Now, that's the Lord Jesus Christ talking about that thing. Hell may not be a thing you'd like to talk about or like to think about, but you're going to have to deal with it because it's one of the main subjects of Jesus Christ preaching. Jesus Christ says in Matthew chapter 25 about a certain class of people, Depart from you, cursed and everlasting fire, prepare for the devil and his angels. Jesus says in Luke chapter 16, The rich man died and was buried, and hell lifted his eyes, being in torment, and see if Abraham afar off. And said to send Lazarus and dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. He says in this passage here, where the worm dieth not, the fire is not quenched. He said in another place, he said, it's better for you to enter into life maimed, having uh, one leg or one arm or one eye than two arms or two eyes or two legs, than to be cast into hell. He said, fear him is able to destroy both body and soul in hell. Now what do you got to say? See, it's amazing how smart Americans think they are. You sit there and you say, well, I still think, well, who cares what you think? The only sinless man that ever lived talked about it over and over and over and over and over and over, and when I compare your life with his, I know who to believe. Now, I'm going to talk this morning about four surprises in hell. When I talk about these things, I'm talking about four surprises you're going to get when you get to hell. And in talking about these things, you understand, I don't want you to go, and I hope you don't go, and uh, you don't have to go, so don't go. But if you go, and some of you will, you make it. Nothing I'm going to say is going to change you a bit. Some of you are going to make it, and when you get there, there are going to be four surprises you're going to get. And I'm going to talk about those four surprises, so when you run into them, you won't be as surprised as you would have been otherwise. Now, first of all, I'm going to say this. The first surprise you're going to get when you wind up in hell, the first surprise you're going to get is to find out that it's there. Right. You see, and somewhere in your imagination, you thought all along, well, it just couldn't be. And then you're going to find out it is. And that's going to be a surprise. You see, the, word, the world jokes about hell so much, after a while you get taken it lightly. I mean, out there in the job, you guys will work out in the job. You know how it is. You know, hell this and hell that and hell so-and-so and hell so-and-so, and I'll knock the hell out of you. Why, people use that expression all the time. And they use it so much after a while, people think it's just, you know, an expression. You're going to be shocked when you find out it's not an expression. It's a reality. Hell is no joke. It's no joke. And you're going to find out when you get there. You're going to be shocked when you find out when you get there. A fellow told me one time, he said, well, you know, he said, heaven for climate, hell for company. 
He said, I think all the interesting folks are going to be in hell. Well, maybe they'll be in hell, but you won't be interested in them when you get there. And they won't be interested in you. You can't be interested in somebody and have big fellowship when you're suffering third-degree burns in fire. It doesn't work out that way. Uh, they, they have all kinds of things about that. I heard a fellow say one time, I, I dealt with a hippie downtown one time about going to hell, and he said, when I get to hell, I'm going to take over. I'll, show, I'll be in charge of stoking the furnace, and I'll take over the place. What a, what a saphead, man. I looked at that guy. He had, he had arms like pipe stems, you know. <laughs> he couldn't have busted his way out of a paper bag, man. Have you ever noticed how most of those hippies uh, pose? They always pose in jackets or clothes on. You know why that is? Because most of them from the waist up look like a, an emaciated giraffe. That's the problem. <laughs> I mean, they're like bugs that come out of the woodwork at night, you know, and they, they they're stay sleeping all the daytime. They come out the white as paste. Little got old arms, that and a bunch of baby fat on them. They're no kind of condition, those people. I'm going to take it over. No, you ain't going to take it over. Folks joke about it. They talk, joke about going to hell because they think God wouldn't do it. Why, the new translations all get rid of hell. Don't you know that? Have you got your new international version? You won't find hell in that book. It says Hades. You won't find any hell there. I mean, uh, smooth, they smooth the text out for ears polite and snugly keep damnation out of sight, as an old uh, British divine one said one time. Uh, the new Bible, they'll translate the word Uranus for heaven or Shemayim for heaven, but they won't translate the word Hades. They won't translate that. Upset folks. As a consequence, you have a whole race of people, a whole generation of people, three or four generations of people in America, they think hell's gotten air conditioned the last 20 or 30 years. <laughs> Let me tell you something. When you find folks who think hell's been air conditioned, you're talking to folks about to move in. Right. I learned that. When you hear a fellow guy fixing up hell to make it a decent place to live in, it's because he's about to move in. That's how that thing works. But the thing is, you don't think God would do it. And I know your reasoning on it. You reason, well, why God wouldn't do a thing like that. I wouldn't do a thing like that. Why, I don't hate him by enough to see him burn forever. Why, but God Almighty hates somebody to burn him, let him burn forever. God is love. 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 I have to get off that kick sometime. That Bible says, Our God is a consuming fire. That book says, Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, I will repay. You know what your problem is? You've got a God after your own image. In your mind, I, you wouldn't uh, let anybody burn in hell uh, forever, so you don't think God would do it, because after all, he must, 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 must be much more forgiven than you are, merciful than you are. I mean, I, what, we can't think like God, people. We're not God. We're sinners. We don't think like God thinks. Why, there's anybody in this building that would sentence anybody to the electric chair for stealing fruit off a tree. You wouldn't send anybody to, to die for stealing fruit of a tree, would you? Of course you wouldn't. But God did. You see, you don't think like God. I mean, there's anybody in this building who hates anybody enough to want to see him burn forever. Not forever, you know. Maybe a little while. <laughs> but not forever. I mean, you wouldn't imagine such hatred that would cause an enemy to burn forever and ever. Not that much. But you know what the problem is? You don't think like God thinks. God is holy. You're not holy. God lives forever. You don't live forever. I mean, some little sin, some little sin, you know, committed against you could be paid for in 60 or 70 years because you may not live longer than 60 or 70 years or 80 years the most. But what are you going to do when you sin against a being who lives forever? What are you going to do when you sin against a being who never dies? You know when you quit paying for your sins? You quit paying for your sins when he dies, and you won't quit paying a moment before. Thus saith the Lord, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my thoughts are higher than your thoughts, and my ways are higher than your ways, saith the Lord. But our trouble is real simple. We can't think like God thinks. Jesus Christ speaks of it. You're going to be surprised when you get there, first of all, to find that it's there. All right, I'll tell you something else you're going to be surprised to find. You're going to be amazed to find how quick you got there. You'll be amazed to find how quickly life passed and went by. You know, teach, teachable teens and tireless 20s and thriving 30s and fiery 40s and failing 50s and sickly 60s and senile 70s and aching 80s and the sod and God. Here today, gone tomorrow. 
Bibles, what is your life? It's a vapor that appears for a while and then vanishes away. You're going to be amazed to find out how quick you got there. You could have sworn you had more time than what you had, and suddenly your time doesn't give out. They had a song they used to sing. I haven't heard it sung now for a long, long time. But they used to sing a song uh, in the Youth for Christ meetings called I've Got Plenty of Time. And the way that song goes, the fellow keeps talking about all the time he's got, and he's going to get saved later, and going to get saved later, and going to get saved later. And he keeps singing, i got plenty of time, i got plenty of time. And the first thing you know, he's dead and in hell. And the hell, he looks up to the fire, and he says, now I've got plenty of time. And you will. You've plenty of time then. But you'll be amazed that you got there so quickly. I'm here today, gone tomorrow. Time runs out. There's that famous scene of Queen Anne, an unsaved British ruler, when she died, the night before she died, she'd been in bed for several months, and they thought she was too feeble to get up, and a nurse went out of the room to get something and came back in. When she came back in, she saw the queen standing up there in one corner of the room looking at a large clock, standing up against the wall, just staring at it. And she was standing up there in her royal robes looking at that clock. And the nurse said, uh, get back into bed. Get back in bed, Your Highness. Get back in bed. You're sick. And there wasn't any answer. And she said, Your Highness, what are you doing? What are you doing? And the woman didn't do anything. She just stood there and just looked at the clock like that. For about 10 minutes, then went back and lay down in the bed. And about five minutes, she was dead. It runs out. It runs out. And it runs out quicker than you ever thought of it run out. You're going to be surprised how quick the thing runs out. A fellow had a dream one night, and in the dream he told about it. And he said, I dreamt and had a dream. And he said, I wonder if you could interpret it for me. And the man said, well, maybe. And he said, well, I dreamt in my dream, and a tiger was chasing me. And he said, this tiger chased me all through the jungles. And he said, and chased me and chased me. And I was getting to a place where I was faint. I knew the tiger was going to catch me. And I said, I came to a dead end. I came to a cliff. And I said, I looked over the cliff, and down the bottom of the cliff, there was a pond down there, and there were crocodiles in the pond looking up at me. And he said, the tiger was behind me, going to catch me in a matter of seconds. And he said, I had nowhere to go but off the cliff. And he said, I knew I was doomed. And then he said, I saw a rope tied to a stump there beside the cliff and hanging off the cliff. And he said, I grabbed hold of that rope and slid down about 10 feet off that rope, and I was safe from the tiger. And he said, I was swinging there, hanging that rope, congratulate myself. And he said, about that time, I noticed some rats came out on the cliff above me and began to gnaw up that rope. <laughs> and he said, what does that dream mean? And the man said, well, he said, the tiger is your conscience. And he said, that uh, rope, he said, is your life. And he said, those crocodiles waiting down there are judgment. And he said, those, those rats are time. Chewing away at that rope. And pretty soon, she busts, boy, and it is a point of men wants to die and ask this to judgment. And there you are. And this, you're before me. If you stood before me, you wouldn't have any problems. You could find as much wrong with me as I could find wrong with you. We could just, you know, throw rotten eggs at each other till it came out a draw. If Buddha was going to judge you, you wouldn't have any problem. A lot wrong with Buddha. If Mama was going to judge you, you could always find fault with him, you know, an epileptic and cursing Christians and Jews and that kind of thing. But if you could, you could judge Buddha, you could say, you lazy bum, you went out and sat under a bull tree and never took care of your wife, and you know, that kind of stuff. But listen, you're going to be judged by a perfect, sinless man. Paul says in Acts, he said, the day, God of the point of the day in which you judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained and given them all men assurance everywhere in that if raised him from the dead. So God has taken one man and brought him up from the dead to show you that's a perfect man, that's the man you're going to be judged by. You're going to find that your time ran out too quick and too short. You didn't have time or how to get going. You're going to be surprised at that when that thing takes place. Sam Jones had a friend back in the Civil War days who was a Christian and witness to the troops in the Civil War, and he had a brother who was unsaved, and his brother got wounded to some action around uh, Antietam, Sharpsburg, and he was in a field hospital there, very crude makeshift outfit, and dying. And this brother came in, got it, went by his cot where the fellow was lying there dying in great pain and tried to witness to him. And his brother said, I can't talk about it right now. I'm hurting. It bothers me to talk about it and think about it. And he said, but brother, you may face God pretty soon. Don't you think it's about time? He said, I'll talk to you about it in the morning. I'll talk to you about it in the morning. And this young boy, he lay down beside his brother that night and slept by him there in the field hospital. And they're going to talk with him the next morning. And that night he had a dream. And he dreamt in that dream that along about the middle of the night, uh, he 
looked over and saw his brother, and his brother was lying there in that makeshift cot, and opened his mouth, and his soul came out of his mouth. And then he said in that dream, he dreamt that that soul began to look around that room like a soul was in a panic, and find that soul tore over and hid in the fireplace, behind the log in the fireplace. And about that time, something happened. The door of that makeshift hospital opened up, and the devil came in. And he walked right over to the, where that boy had been dying, looked down his mouth. And not seeing anything, he began to look all over the barracks for that soul. And look under the cots and look at the other men. And finally, he ran over to the fireplace and got fooled around with a wood pilot by the fireplace. And then he said he heard a shriek, and that soul came out of that fireplace and sailed out the door of the devil after it. And then he heard a horrible scream out there in the woods someplace where the devil laid his hand on that soul and got a hold of it, and that shriek woke him up. And when he woke him up, he thought, well, I got just a dream. He was over there, the, his brother lying next to him, he was stone dead, mouth wide open like that. He said, what's the moral of that? I don't know what the moral of that is. I just know this. I know you're here today and you're gone tomorrow and before some of you know it, you're going to be there. And when you get there, you're going to be amazed how quick that trip was. If some, of you t if some of you told the truth here tonight, you'd have to tell me the truth and say it was just like day before yesterday, you were going to grade school and now you're a grandfather or a grandmother. And it was just the other day. I mean, I'm up in years now. I know how quick the years go, boy. When you get past 60, they begin to move. They begin to move. And one of these days, you're going to be there. And when you get there, you're going to be amazed to find how quickly you got there. Well, I'll tell you something else you're going to be amazed to find. You're going to be amazed to find that that place is filled with religious people. You probably always thought the fellow's religion did the best he could, that he'd make out all right. But you're going to wake up someday and find there you're in a place that's filled with religious people. You're going to look around there and find a young fellow there and say, what in the world are you doing down here? Did you kill somebody? No, I never killed anybody in my life. Well, you must have been some extortioner, embezzler, or robbed poor folks or something. What'd you do? Nothing. I didn't do anything. I honored my father and mother all my life. I never even lied since I was a boy. You said, that's impossible. A man got to lie once in a while. And this fellow says, I never bore false witness my youth up and honored my mother and my father. And you'll say, what's your name? And you'll say, I'm the rich young ruler. That's Luke 18. He's better than a man in this building. But he wasn't saved. You'll get down there and you'll find a fellow down there and say, what'd you do? You a rapist or a, an abortionist or a child molester or something? Did you kidnap somebody or torture somebody to death? And he'll say, no, 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 I, I fasted twice a week and gave tithes of all that I possessed. So I know who you are. You're that Pharisee over there in Luke chapter 18. You get through and you'll find a fellow there and say, who are you? He'll say, I'm a healing evangelist. You'll say, what? A healing evangelist. You talk in tongues? Sure, I had all the signs. Tongues are for a sign. Not to them that believe, to them that believe not. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 22. I could raise the dead. I could heal the sick. I could cast out devils. I could clean the lepers. I'd say there must be some mistake. He'd say, no, I'm, I'm, I'm a healing evangelist. I, I did wonderful works in his name and cast out devils in his name. And if you're down there in the hell with him, you'll say, what is your name? And he'll say, Judas, Judas, Judas. He had the signs. He had the healing. He had the gifts. And he lost. You're going to get down there and you'll find some of these vicars of Christ were nothing but just poor, lost politicians down with their beads and everything else. Oh, yes, I was a vicar of Christ. I just made one mistake. I was never born again. <laughs> That's the only mistake you have to make. You're going to get down there and you're going to find out that that place is filled with religious people, people who did the best they could. The Bible said there's a way which seemeth right to a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. One time a fellow got saved through a dream about hell. He dreamed he died and went to hell, and when he got down to hell, he looked up through the fire and through the smoke, and he saw a clock just hanging out there in the air above the smoke. And one of his friends that he talked to about the dream said, well, what was unusual about that? He said, well, the thing was unusual about this clock was, he said, it didn't have any hands. It was a clock that looked just like that. It doesn't need any hands. You know why it doesn't need any hands? Because once you're in there, you don't get out. 
the passage of time doesn't make any difference. A fellow said one time, he singing, he said, when we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. Well, if that's true, when you've been in the pit 10,000 years, in fire hotter than the sun, you've no less days to weep and wail than when you first begun. Mine a breakdown into that. You can't understand that. Eternal punishment, eternal retribution. You are so blessed, and I believe God is merciful. What's the sense of what's the sense of asking for mercy if it's automatic? What's this fellow doing, saying God be merciful me a sinner if it's automatic? Yeah. Yeah. Folks don't think. You think God just automatically just overlook it, do you? Then why did He tell you to call on His name? Yeah. Let me ask you this. What is the sense of you coming to God for mercy when you hate the one that dispenses the mercy? Mercy. What's the point in that? Why, if he gave you mercy, you wouldn't love him any more than otherwise. I mean, if you hate the one dispensing the mercy, what good is going to do for him to give you any mercy anyway? Folks, I don't, I don't know why they think the way they think. Why, well, listen, if God Almighty told you, come boldly to the throne of grace to obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need, if that man prayed and said, God be merciful me, a sinner, and Christ said he went down to his house justified rather than the other, if the Lord said that, and he sure said that, then you must need something, and it's not automatic. And that is not all. The one who dispenses mercy says, I will be merciful to whom I be merciful, and whom I will I harden. The Lord determines who the conditions for mercy. It is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God, but of God that showeth mercy. God has told you his terms for having mercy on you. And his terms, and you'll meet his terms or not, his terms for having mercy on you are, is the finished work of his son on Calvary's cross. Those are his terms. You got yours? Well, it's not of him that willeth. You can't will for God to have mercy upon you. You can't make God have mercy upon you. You can't come to God and say, okay, you're going to give me mercy because I do this and this and this and this, and I was taught to do this and this, and I do this and this and that. God Almighty has already decided where he's going to have mercy on you. He's going to have mercy with you at Calvary. You don't meet him there, there's no mercy. That's all through the Old Testament. I'll have no more mercy upon them. I will not love them anymore. That's all through there. Sometime it, 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 there's the end of it. I've got a friend out in San Antonio named Kincaid. Call him Kitty Cat Kincaid. Looks like a cat. My little boy, is a, he worked at the air base there in San Antonio. They got a couple of them. I don't remember the names of them. But he worked at an air base on this, uh, on this uh, Mayday crew that goes out when there's an accident or something, you know, and puts foam on the runway and all that kind of stuff. And he told me of a case there where a pilot came in, Mayday, 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 and they got all the stuff, crashed stuff ready and got their ass bested suits and went tearing down the strip when he came in there. And he went out there and did a couple of loops and turned over and the plane caught on fire and all that high octane fuel was burning and roaring. And he said, when we came up to that plane, got out and ran toward it, we could hear that pilot in the cockpit screaming above the roar of that plane. And he was screaming and saying, cut my legs off, cut my legs off. For God's sake, somebody cut my legs off. Had his legs jammed up under the control panel there and couldn't get him out. You see what happened to him? He burned to death. He burned to death. You know what that fellow had been willing to do? He'd been willing to lose his legs to get out of that fire. I said he'd been willing to lose his legs to get out of that fire. And Christ said it had been better for a man to come into life halt, life halt, maimed, and blind than having two legs or two eyes to be cast into the fire where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. If a man be willing to give up his legs to get out of physical fire, you shouldn't blanch at the thought of giving up something to receive Jesus Christ. I mean, giving up stuff isn't going to save you. But if the reason why you have not come to Jesus Christ is because of something that you're holding on to, that you're afraid God take from you, it'll damn you. One time, Danny Castle, a friend of mine, said to a young lady in his congregation up there up in Carolina, or down Car or wherever it is from here, he said to her, he said, uh, he said, if you don't quit that dance, it'll send you to hell. And she said, I don't believe dance will send anybody to hell. He said, it'll send you to hell. And she said, well, I was taught that a person goes to hell for rejecting Jesus Christ. And they said, I know it, but that's why you're rejecting Jesus Christ, because you won't give up that dancing. Yeah, dance will send you to hell. Smoking will send you to hell. Drink will send you to hell. Being tight with your money, your kinfolks will send you to hell. Listen, 
whatever, whatever it is that's keeping you from accepting Christ, but that'll finish you. I don't care if it's just temper or big mouth, that'll finish you off. I had, a, I had a relative down there in Alabama years ago. He was an old farmer down there and a chronic alcoholic, been a chronic alcoholic for years. And I used to witness to him. My little girl used to witness to him. She used to cry up in his, uh, climb up in his lap, you know, and, and sing, Jesus loved me, this I know, because the Bible tells me so. And she was about four years old. That old sinner would get just in an agony, man. He'd get bawling and shove her off his lap and run back to the room crying and saying, now look what you did to me. Now look what you did to me. I'll just tear him up. I witnessed that fellow many times. He gave me he gave me a good watch for Christmas one time, big old uh, engineer watch, one of them pocket watches. And he said, "I think every other preacher ought to know when to quit preaching." <laughs> you know, ha ha ha. You know. <laughs> I said, "Yeah, you're right, Papa. You're right." And I said, "Let me ask you something." I said, "I'm going to take this." But I said, "Suppose I didn't take this. Suppose you giving this to me for Christmas. Suppose I gave it back to you. You get kind of upset, wouldn't you?" And he said, "No, I don't want to get upset." got real red in the face. And I said, well, I'm, I'm going to take it. I'm not going to give it back to you. But I said, how do you suppose God feels when you turn down the gift of God, which is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord? Amen. And off he went. That old boy got saved right before he died. And I told that old boy one time, I said, Pop May, I said, you know what your trouble is? I said, every time you look at Jesus Christ hanging on the cross, you see a whiskey bottle right next to him. And every time you're called upon to choose, you take the bottle. That's your trouble. So you're sitting here this morning, it's Christ right there and there's a woman right over here. Or a bottle of liquor. Or a bag of money. I mean, folks got all kinds of alibis. I don't know what it is. I know one thing. When you get there, you're going to be surprised to find religious people there. And you're going to be surprised to when you realize the, the magnitude of your error. The thing that's going to shock most of you when you get there is to realize what a horrible terrible, ghastly, tragic mistake you made just because you didn't use good sense. Amen. People, what is the sense in going to a place like that? You don't have to go. Now, if you had to go, then you know there might be something to it, but you don't have to go. That Bible said the Lord is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That Bible says, As I live, saith the Lord, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but he turned from his way, and that he live. For why will you die, O house of Israel? God is not for you going to hell. He says, Depart from you, cursed and everlasting fire, prepared for what? For what? Can't. Louder. You see, it ain't for people. God never made that place for you to go to. That place was prepared for Satan and his angels. And if you wind up there, you wind up in the wrong place. God never intended for you to go there. Why go? Hey, man, doesn't that strike you as rather stupid? But you talk about stupid. Why, well, that's so stupid, it's just tragic. It's, it's a horror. I mean, think of going to a place like that, and you didn't have to go. What a thing. Boy, when that thing strikes, you'll be the worst surprise you ever had in your life. I mean, God has blocked the way to hell for you with a thousand roadblocks. Did you ever stop think of all the roadblocks God has put in your way to keep you out of hell? Did you ever think about that? There's a Bible. Every Bible in this country, I don't care if it's even a bad translation, is a roadblock warning you that something's out ahead. Every church steeple in this country, every church bell in this country is a warning. I know some of them aren't preaching the truth. I know some of them are dead and cold. I know some are heretical. But every church building in this country is a witness to you that there's something up ahead. It's a warning. It's a warning. But listen, your friends are warnings. Your friends don't want you to go to hell. Who would want a man to go to hell if he was his friend? Your family would want you to go to hell. The rich man in hell said, said Lazarus and dipped his, dipped his finger in water. And then he said, go tell my father because I've got five brothers in my father's house and I don't want them to come here. Let me ask you something. If your friends don't want you to go to hell and your family don't want you to go to hell and I don't want you to go to hell and the people in hell don't want you to come, how are you going to make it? Unless you just determine to go. Almighty sent the Holy Spirit down this world for 2,000 years to convict man of sin, the rights of judgment, so you wouldn't have to go. 
If you go to hell, you've got to fight against God. Listen, you've got to conquer the Holy Spirit in order to make it. I'll tell you another roadblock God sent you away, and that's Calvary. Before you go to hell, you've got to get by a blood. You got to go right over somebody loving you enough to die for you and shed blood for you. And if you're going to make it to hell, you got to got to go right over that cross. You got a hard trip ahead of you, brother. You got a hard trip ahead of you. Sam Jones, the old-time Methodist evangelist, said he was at a camp meeting one time where there was a very wicked, ungodly fellow. He was a rich farmer, had a saved wife, been praying for him for years, and had half the camp praying for that fellow. Back in those days, uh, those camp meetings were on five, six weeks. They'd live in little old huts and sheds while the camp meeting was going on. Sometimes four or five preachers would be preaching at the same time, a couple of acres away from each other. And during that meeting, that fellow got a terrible conviction. And find everybody begging to get saved and turning the Lord down. He went back to his shack that night to go to sleep, and he told his wife, you stay with Mr. So-and-so tonight, I'm going to have this thing out with God and have it out alone. And the fellow went in that little old shack and stayed there all night. And some folks stayed up all night praying for him to get saved. And the next morning, Sam said that fellow came out of that little old shack and came out of there about 6 in the morning, face just as hard as granite. And he said they all took one look at him and they knew what had happened. He'd won. He beat God out. He conquered the Lord, and the Lord never fooled him. There are fellows like that. There are fellows like that. You're going to be surprised when you get there to realize how stupid you were and what a terrible thing it was for you to do what you did. You're going to see that as the worst mistake you ever made in your life and a mistake you'll never recover from and a mistake that'll last forever. It's one of those irremediable things that cannot be fixed. Time in this life can fix some things or remedy some things, and if it can't, at least death can fix some things and remedy some things. But there's a mistake you're going to make that you're not going to get over, and there's no remedy to it. Jack Hyle was in the paratroops back there earlier in his years before he got called to preach, and one of his job was packing chutes for a demonstration. I think it was 101st Airborne, and they were packing chutes. He was a packer, and the packers had to put the name and the number of their work on the chute when they packed the chute, and just in case something went wrong, and it went wrong, and that demonstration with the big brass around, everybody pulling out of the sky like popcorn. They saw one fellow out of there, and his chute didn't open, and he just fell like a plummet right to the earth, and when he hit, you could stir him with your foot. And they had colonels and majors, you know, and the IG around there, you know, who packed this man's chute, and who this and this and that, and they called for the chute packers, and Jack Hiles loved them. He stayed at, up half the night with a buddy at a table packing chutes, and he said as the jeep took him over where that fellow had uh, hit the ground, he all the way over there, he was thinking to himself, I hope it wasn't me, I hope it wasn't me, I hope it wasn't me, I hope it wasn't me. And they got there and checked that guy shooting her, and the kids uh, sitting right, standing right next to Jack Hiles that night packing chutes had packed that guy's chute. His number was stamped on there. When they showed that kid that number, he was up there taking off his overseas hat and pulling his hair and crying and saying, Oh, if I'd just been more careful, if I'd just been more careful, if I'd just been more careful. Well, it's too late. Now see, there'll come a time for some of you. I don't wish it on you. God knows I don't. Anybody. My worst enemy, I wouldn't wish it on him. Worst enemy I have on this earth, I wouldn't wish it on him. But there'll come a time when it'll be Oh, my God, if I'd just been more careful, if I'd just been more careful. Well, I'm talking to you, and you're looking at me, and you see a picture, and you got your senses about you, and you can do something now. But after a while, you won't be able to do anything. Be careful. Be careful. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we ask you to bless upon the message this morning. I pray if there's any unsaved person here today, They'll act now on the message and do something about what they've heard. We pray for them this hour. While the heads are bowed and eyes are closed, these musicians play something that'll touch the heart and, and, and stimulate the mind, the will to act while there's any life and hope left. We pray people act now and not put this thing off and then have to face that terrible reality someday and say, oh my God, if I've just done the right thing and they can do it now. You've given them life and breath now. They can act now. And I pray they'll act now at the invitation. Lord, I pray especially for some sinner here this morning that's lived a good life and tried to behave themselves and live a righteous, moral life and have 
have gotten through undetected and unsuspected and got through on the basis of their life and have fooled themselves into thinking everything's all right when it's not. Now I pray this morning that I might openly confess the Lord Jesus Christ as the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world and not be ashamed of him, but act today. Let us remain in prayer a few minutes while the musicians are playing and the moment we're going to stand and sing. You've read the invitation dozens of times. Some of you folks raised up in this part of the country, you've probably been to this church dozens of times. You've heard Pastor Schmuck give invitations. Some of you may have had him deal in your own home. Probably this past has been the home of some of you folks and tried to win you to Christ. You're familiar with everything we're doing here this morning. The thing is, you're not giving it serious thought. You're not being careful. You're not taking the you're not taking the concern with it. You've taken with your wife and your kids and your bills and your insurance. Some of you folks I'm talking to right now are covered with every kind of insurance in this world in case something goes wrong. You've been very careful. But you haven't been careful with your soul. You need some fire insurance. And Christ died for you to pay for your sins so you wouldn't have to experience the other side of God's nature. That's why he said God is so loved. He talked about death and crucifixion. Father, bless your word. Bless the invitation. Bless these people here this morning with a sense of your presence. Holy Spirit of God, I pray might deal with these people here this morning and confirm the truth of these matters. If these things are so, I'm counting on you to make them so. If these things are true, I'm counting on you to confirm your word. I, I believe what you said, and I preach it the way you wrote it. And you'll have to confirm the truth, because you're the way, the truth, and the life. And I pray this morning, nobody, nobody, no, not a man, not a woman, not a child this building, go out that door and sit down at a meal today without having taken care of this matter permanently. And I ask it in the name of Jesus Christ, amen, amen, amen. Amen. Let's stand and sing. What number, brother? 221. 221. You all know it. 221. Just I am without one plea. You sung it dozens of times, but you need to think about it. But that thy blood was shed for me, and that thy bids me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come. Now come on, act, move, come, step out, do something. Don't wind up that day and say, if I'd only been more careful. Wind up in the day and say, thank God that Sunday morning at the Red Lion Bible Church, I got the thing fixed. Are right, listening just as I am? Just as I am. One week, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou didst me come to get along about in here, then the images begin to arise in your mind, the doubts begin to arise, and you say, well, if I go down there, accept the Lord Jesus, then this, and then this, and then this, you start figuring out, and it's going to cost you your soul, brother, sister, it's going to cost you your soul. If that book is right, you, you haven't got any way to figure it, but just shall live by faith. You better get that settled before you get anything settled. You get that settled, and then we'll, we'll see about the rest. Blessing just as I am and waiting not. Just as I am and waiting not to rid my soul of one dark blood to me whose blood can cleanse each blood who am of God. small communities like this up and down the country, you get things for granted. For every Sunday and then the invitation and the message, you know, Brother Schmuck been around here for years and years, hometown boy, you all know him, just take it for granted, you know, good old Brother Schmuck, yeah, I know Brother Schmuck, uh -huh. God planted that fellow right here, planted him right here to keep that thing in front of your eyes day and night and night and day and day and night. The not married communities where God has to take some fellow and put him right there as a watchman to warn you day and night and day. 
you better take advantage of it. There are some communities that don't have anybody. I can take you to Germany right now and take you down to Bayern and over Amrigau and Mittenwald and Garmisch, part of Kirchen down through there, and Berchtesgaden, and I'll show you a place down there where town after town after town after town hasn't had a real biblical witness for a hundred years. Now you got one right here. You better act. You better act. You better act now. How many of you people are saved and know it? Would you raise your hand? You're saved, you know it. All right. You folks that are saved and know it, you know what you were saved from. You know. You know. One of the first things a fellow, one of the first things that happened to a fellow when he gets saved, he had a burden to talk to somebody about salvation. Because he realizes what he's been saved from. And the, the sudden thought comes to him, man, if I was fooled, they could be fooled. That's the first thing that happened to a fellow when he gets saved. And some of you probably had people in the street and try to win you to Christ. And that's what they had in mind. They were, they weren't, you know, fanatical Bible thumpers trying to, you know, you know, ram religion down your throat. It isn't like that. He didn't like that. When a man gets saved, his eyes are open, and he sees what was ahead, and he's concerned about you. And I'm concerned about you. Your past is concerned about you. We're going to sing one more stanza. You've had enough. You've had, you know what to do. Now, be careful here. Be careful. Don't, don't take a chance. If you're not sure about it, get it settled now. Come while we sing. Brother, lead us one more stanza. The Lord deal with you. Come on. Come on and come now. Don't take a chance. sing another verse folks I, I don't know but I know there's people here this morning that have never trusted Christ as their Savior you may have gone through some easy believism and you know that's what it amounts to today if you just believe and I believe there's a difference in believing with your head and your heart there's a difference in just saying words folks and I believe because you've said words, some of you, you're counting on that and you think everything's all right. But deep down in your heart, you know that you're, you're not sure. I'm asking you, can you remember a time when you really meant business and you've asked Jesus Christ to save you, realizing that you were lost and on your way to hell, and you've asked him to save you, and you know for sure you're saved. I don't know what some of you people are waiting on. I believe with all my heart, Jesus Christ is coming. Amen. And I believe it could be today. Oh, I know some of you people say, I, I've heard that so often, preacher. And they've said that when, when my daddy was a little, granddaddy was a little fella. But I'll guarantee you we're closer today than they were then. Amen. And I believe if you know anything about the Bible, the trouble with so many of you people here today is you just don't want to be bothered. You want to come to church on Sunday morning and hang it up when you go out the door and pick it up when you come in next week. You just don't want to be bothered. I'll guarantee you, to be saved, it will cost you something. The doctor.